digital copy of the notes for tonight. This is your QR code if you want to scan it. Um, I'm just going to set it up here. You don't have to pass around or anything. Um, Curtis asked me to do that. So, so if, uh, if you want digital notes, so you can scribble on it. Uh, you can just get your phone out, get your camera, scan your code. Uh, but if you have your regular notes, uh, we will be in uh, Romans chapter 1, starting at the very, very beginning of the book. Um, Lex, are we started? Am I on here? I'm on, I'm on right here? Cool. All right. This is nice. I get, I get 40 minutes of teaching. This is the most, this is the most Curtis has ever given me. I feel like a, I feel like a kid in a candy store right now. But we will be doing a systematic verse by verse, phrase by phrase breakdown of the book of Romans. And I'm going to do my best. As uh, me and Curtis were talking, my plan is two weeks per chapter. Some chapters might end up being a little bit longer. Some chapters might end up just being <coughs> one week. But as it stands right now, it averages out about two weeks per chapter. So this one, we're going to start in the introduction. And we're going to go through the introduction of Paul to the uh, Church of Rome. So let's jump in into it Romans chapter 1 and we will read uh, the section of scripture that we're going to go through and then we'll start breaking it down piece by piece so if you're there Romans chapter 1 starting in verse 1 going to verse 7 Paul a bond servant of Christ Jesus called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son who was born of the descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with the power of the resurrection of the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, Grace to you, peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to kind of break down the intro here, but let's lay a little bit of groundwork of cultural context, of where we're at in history, what's going on before we dive directly into the scriptures. So basic knowledge here. It was written by the Apostle Paul, as we saw in verse 1. It was written, he was writing it in the city of Corinth. So that's where he wrote most of his letters while he was in Corinth. That's where a lot of the epistles were written and sent out around 57 AD. Now this is really close to when Paul actually made it to Rome and then actually ended up being martyred for his faith by, uh, by the Caesar. In this book... He addresses both Jews and Gentiles. So he's addressing both demographics of the Christian faith. A lot of times when we're reading through the book of Romans, we're going to have to discern who is he specifically talking to. Is he talking to Jews right now or is he talking to Gentiles? As we progress through, we'll get to chapter 9. And chapter 9 is, is really about uh, the, the nation of Israel and who he's talking to there, and, and it's a big mix of he's addressing in this verse, he's addressing the Jews, in this verse, he's addressing the Gentiles. So as we progress through this book, it's good to keep in mind who he's addressing and when he's addressing them. The book of Romans is a theological letter that Paul wrote to the book of Romans. So he writes this, and you'll see, we'll see later on in the book that he says, I don't write this for you because you don't know this. He says, I'm writing this to you because you already know this and I'm just reminding you. I'm sending you a reminder. How many of you need reminders all the time? Either a text reminder, an alarm reminder, some type of reminder. This is what Paul's doing to the church of Rome. 
Now, he didn't plant the Church of Rome like he did most of the other letters that he sent out to other churches. He knew the Church of Rome because their name was and their faith was known throughout all of the land. Their faith for standing up for the faith in the midst of terrible circumstances, their faith was known far and wide. So Paul says, I long to be with you, so I'm writing this to you. Another thing about Rome, or about the book of Romans, is that he is heavy on writing to the Jews because his next stop was his heart was to be in Jerusalem. As he's writing in Rome, he says, I long to be with you in Rome, but I am longing to be in Jerusalem. So he, he, his calling, as we see at, through, his, uh, through the Acts of the Apostles and in his letters, is to go to the Jews, is to, to evangelize and, and, and proselytize the Jews to know that Christ is the Messiah. The main overarching theme of the whole book of Romans is the power of the gospel of Christ. Amen. It's getting the foundation of the theological truth of who Christ is so that we can understand the gospel more so that we can be empowered to go share the gospel. Everything in this book points to the gospel of Christ and who Jesus is. Everything in this book points to that. We were, I was listening to a pastor this past Tuesday and his, his kind of go-to word was pinch and zoom. So like when you're on your, like on your phone or on your tablet, we, you're always pinching and zooming. You get the big picture of the gospel here. But as we pinch and zoom into the book of Romans, you'll see a lot of awesome theological depth to it. But don't get too weighed down by it because just remember, it always points back to the power of the gospel of Christ. So, as we continue on here, there are four points that I kind of want to make, and you can follow this through the notes here. Is one, when we start in verse one here, it's our identity is in the gospel. Because if you read the epistles that Paul writes, every time he introduces himself, he says, I, Paul, a bond servant of Christ, an apostle, he always, he always links himself, he marries himself to Christ because that is his identity. He is, his identity is found in Christ. That's the first thing we look at is this introduction in verse 1 is broken up into three parts. So first we're going to look at the, the overarching, our identity is in the gospel. But what does Paul say about himself as he's introducing himself in this letter? One, he says he's a bondservant. Two, he says he's an apostle. And three, he says he's set apart. The bondservant really sticks out to me. Because the bondservant is really a word for slave. And not in in a slave of captivity, but a bondservant is most often in Roman culture, if you are called a bondservant, now remember, we're in, we're in 52 AD, so a little bit of a different cultural context than we have right now. A bondservant is someone who is in devoted, permanent servitude by choice. So Paul is recognizing that he, in him, he's saying, I am serving Christ indefinitely until my last day because that is my choice. That is what I desire to do. So that's who he, who he claims to be at the very beginning, is a servant. A, a slave to Christ was his choice. Second was his title or position that was given to him by Christ is an apostle. So this was his title and his position as a believer, as a man of God who he was working through, through the spirit as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Three, he was set apart. God bless you. So what does set apart mean? Set apart is 
assigned for a purpose. So if you take something, say like you're making an omelet, right? You have your little carton of eggs. You don't take all of your eggs to make your omelet unless you're feeding an army. You just take a couple out and you set them apart. You say, these have a purpose. I'm going to eat these for breakfast today. You take them out, you set them apart. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I have been taken and set apart from the world. That is who we should identify as, as a, a slave to Christ, uh, of servitude to him indefinitely, and that we are different. That we, are, we have been grabbed, pulled out, and set apart. What is the purpose? What was the purpose of pulling him out and setting him apart? Let's, let's go back to the very beginning. What, what is the book of Romans about? It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The purpose of Paul being pulled out and us being set apart and him being set apart and his church being set apart is for the gospel. We see that in, and you wonder, okay, this is kind of like pairing with what Scott's doing a little bit. I can't really articulate or I can't put into my own words what is the gospel? So if you look at your notes there, it's first Col or uh, first Corinthians, I'm said first Colossians. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses three and four. This is Paul, the writer of Romans, is saying, if you don't know what the gospel is, this is what it is. For I delivered you to you as the first importance what I've received, that one, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised. On the third day, according to the scriptures, it says that's the gospel. The gospel is Christ died, buried, resurrecting, and coming again. Amen. Now, I don't want you to just sit here for 40 minutes and listen to Rusty blabber on. Take a couple minutes with who you're sitting around and think about what you're introduction to a letter would be paul says i a bond servant of christ an apostle set apart for the gospel take a minute and discuss with someone next to you what would that look like for you what would yours look like what my mind would you know what would mine look like uh i left it in there it's it's actually right underneath uh our identity in the gospel it says, Rusty, a servant of Christ, a believer set apart for the gospel of Christ. Now imagine sending every email with that as your tagline, right? Everybody would know who you are, what you're about. And that's what Paul was doing as he was writing to the church. So take a second. I encourage you to talk. It's okay. Uh, but what would yours look like? So go ahead. I'll give you a minute. You don't have to be quiet. It's okay. All right, anybody want to share? Maybe maybe their little tagline, their introduction, what, what would that look like? I gave you mine, so I want to hear somebody else's. <laughs> what do you got, Mom? I knew you. I heard you. So, teamwork. <laughs> See, perfect. Yeah, a follower of Christ apart from the world. I mean, the, there can be a lot of things that we can put in there, uh, but it's what 
what do we identify to as like the attributes of Christ and to ourselves and say, is, is that a part of me? Is that who I am? Because that's what Paul did in his letters as he was writing them out is I am, he was attributing characteristics and parts of Christ and what he knows of God to himself as he was learning and knowing and understanding uh, the gospel and, and who he was in the gospel. So verse two says, uh, which he promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Now let's look at this, that this is something that he says to the church of Rome and says that the gospel of Christ was promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Now remember, at this time, they don't have the New Testament. 57 AD. So what are the Holy Scriptures at the time? The Old Testament. The Torah. So he's saying that you can go back to the Old Testament, to the Torah, and see Christ. You can see Jesus. Zacharias has a beautiful empowerment of the Holy Spirit where he prophesies from the Old Testament in Luke uh, 1, 70 to 79. I'm not going to read it all because it's it's a lot, but if you have your notes, you can you can look at that. But the point is that Paul gives validity to the gospel of Christ with historic and prophetic evidence. This is something that that we should not be scared of or ashamed of. This is something that we should know and be able to do. Is when someone says, "Give me evidence. Show me this Jesus." Paul says, yeah, he was given in the prophets. And he goes on and, and shares that. So we should be able to have an account and evidence to say, yeah, what I believe is true because of this. And have evidence. It says, study to show thyself approved a workman that needs not to be ashamed. So let's, rem let's remember and remind ourselves that study is not for the pastors, just for the pastors. It's not just for the, the deacons. It's not just for the teachers. Studying is for every believer so that we can stand and give an account of saying, this is why I trust the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why I'm a follower of Christ. Second point here is the person of the gospel, and in brackets, Jesus. The person of the gospel, verse 3, concerning, <laughs> concerning his son who was born of the descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with the power of the resurrection of the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. These two verses emphasize the sonship of Jesus Christ. Uh, right now, there there is... There's a lot of question and debate going on about the deity, excuse me, the deity of Christ, God's, uh, Jesus' uh, divine nature, that he is God. There's a lot of debate going on right now about that. And the most recent development is, I don't want to say recent because this was fought about in like 150 to 300 A.D., is the, trini the, the aspect of the Trinity, of saying that all three parts of the Godhead are God. Uh, there's an arg there are arguments coming up again, again, and again. This is nothing new under the sun. Uh, but this is a strong, this is strong proof. I don't want to say strong case. This is strong proof of the deity of Christ here. Because it says... In the physical, Jesus was promised to be born of the lineage of David, which we see in the Gospels. We can follow that lineage straight back to who? David. In both Mary and Joseph. So in prophecy, he's already fulfilled that. Now, through the line of David would come the kingdom that would have no end, 
And who is that king? Jesus. Jesus is that king that stands on the throne or sits on the throne to the kingdom that has no end. Now, if you look at the phrase here in verse 3, he's declared the son of God. This is saying that there is oneness in essence. And when I say essence, I mean that in, in being. So there is oneness in the essence or being and the role of dutiful, loving submission to the Father in Jesus' self-emptying incarnation. And, and that's a lot of a lot of kind of fluffy words. But what that's saying is when he says he is declared the Son of God, it's saying that Jesus has been, always will be, the Son of God because of the Father. Because if God is the Father, his character, nature, and being has always been Father. And let's just go down the little rabbit hole just a little bit. Can you be a father without a son? No. So in, in word of God the Father, who has always been eternal and always will be, so was the Son, co-eternal, no beginning, no end, because of the nature of who God is. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always existed, will always exist, and are all uh, God. So that's what declared the Son of God is. If, so we're going to be... We're going to be taking our time, and we're going to be taking this piece by piece. So I don't want to kind of rush through this, but to stick with our deadline, we, we got to kind of move at a, at a decent pace here. If we keep moving on to the phrases here, he says, The resurrection from the dead, this is the most conclusive and infallible evidence of Jesus' lordship because it's in his resurrection. Amen. Who has the keys to life? and death the Lord yeah so who has the power who had the power to lay his life down Jesus who had the power to pick his life back up Jesus so he is demonstrating that he has that power that he is God so again the resurrection from the dead is also to show that uh, if, if we go if we go back to the Old Testament a little bit, uh, God is described as the giver of life. So if Jesus has the, the ability to lay his life down and pick his life back up to give life, then he is God in human form, in God incarnate. So resurrection from the dead, moving on to the uh, spirit of holiness, spirit of holiness. We can word this kind of a different way. If you look at your notes there, it says according to the nature and work of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness. It's according to the nature of how the Holy Spirit works and the work of the Holy Spirit. This is really interesting. So if we go to our scriptures. It says, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Or conceived of the Holy Spirit, sorry. He was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. So Paul concludes that this man, Jesus, one, a descendant of David, who was fully man, declared to be the Son of God, fully God, raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, is Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no mistaking who he is. What he came to do, Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. Amen. And this is what we're getting just in verse 4 here. Like, this is just what Paul is introducing to the book of Romans. 
But if we keep going back to the same idea, don't get lost, don't, don't kind of lose focus, is it always goes back to Jesus. It always goes back to Christ. I have a John MacArthur quote here at the bottom. Uh, it says, uh, kind of sums up who Jesus is. It says, he is Jesus because he saves his people from his sins. That's what, that's what Yeshua means. That Jesus, Yeshua means. He is Christ because he is anointed by God as king and priest. We find that in Hebrews. He is Lord because he is God and sovereign and ruler over all. Because the world is given over to Christ and the world is his footstool. I just thought that was really cool. It breaks down the three parts uh, of Jesus as his physical, spiritual, uh, his, his physical being as he's saving his people from his sins, uh, the spiritual as he is, he is anointed by God as king and priest, and uh, his divine nature as he is ruler and king of everything. So just a question. Um, if you don't have anything to add, that's, that's fine. But my question that here on the paper is, how does this scripture detail Jesus as the person of the gospel. Remember, the, that was our kind of title for this. these two verses was the person of the gospel. And it breaks down and describes Jesus. So how does this scripture detail Jesus as the person of the gospel? And don't everyone jump at once to answer this question. <laughs> so not exactly an answer to your question. Yeah, yeah. But um, just something that was on my heart. Um, when I was doing, when I was teaching VBS, and I was teaching about the Trinity, and uh, something that God laid on my heart was a lot of people have a hard, a hard time understanding how the Trinity could be three and one. And one of the things that God laid on my heart was, you have water, you heat the water up, you have steam, it's like the spirit. You make the water cold, you have ice. There's three different things in one. It's a perfect example. Yeah, yeah, and if uh, if you have time, you can. Uh, another way that you can do that is through. Uh, Try to remember the name of the confession. Um, I think it's the not. No, it's the Nicene Creed. The Ni the Nicene Creed. If you look that up, uh, the first like paragraph is it. T it describes the the Father. It describes the Son. It describes the Holy Spirit and then describes uh, the the aspect of the Trinity as it came out of the the, the, the Council of Nicaea, where there was a, a, a group of, of men sitting there trying to hash out and word the divine aspects of God, which is incredibly difficult because we have finite words for an infinite God. <clears throat> where uh, sometimes the things of the Trinity too, where it's just, it's not wrong to lean on the aspect of faith, of saying, it's just God. I, there are things that are incomprehensible because if he was comprehensible, then he would not be God. Uh, so the people of the gospel is the next section. People of the gospel, his church. Verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you are the called of Jesus Christ. First phrase we're going to look at here is receive grace. That's our conversion. Receive grace is <clears throat> conversion. So where does anything good come from? God. God. We receive grace but grace is undeserved favor 
and we receive that from God. But we receive grace only as a part of conversion. We receive grace from God as we turn to him. Because as we turn to him, that's the, that's the gift that we receive as a part of salvation is the grace and pardon of the judgment of God. So we receive grace, our conversion, because we put our faith in who? Jesus. It all comes back to Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where does grace come from? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that it is not of myself or yourself. It is a gift of God. It is not a result of works. So there's nothing we can do. So that, what? No one can boast about it. God's saying, you can't bring a single thing because I know in your heart if you could bring something, you would boast about it. You'd say, I know, I know Jeff, Jeff would never do this. Be like, you know why I got saved? You know why God gave me grace and mercy? Because I did this. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is a gift from God, prompted by the Holy Spirit to draw us into him, to show us that we are sinners through the gospel that we are called to share. It is a complete work so that we know that I have nothing to do with my salvation, and I also know that it is a gift from God and that he gets all the glory from it. So, uh, let's go down to our next phrase, is uh, obedience and faith. Obedience, so we receive grace through our, uh, with conversion, and we, our obedience and faith is also a synonym for salvation. So he's saying that we receive grace through conversion and that our obedience in faith, because if we look back at Ephesians 2, 8, 9, remember this whole thing is about letting scripture interpret scripture. We, we don't go on our own thoughts. We go back to the word and see what the word has to say. What about the obedience in faith? It says that uh, we are saved through faith. So if... Anyone who professes Christ as their Lord will walk in, if anyone professes Christ, they will walk in obedience. Now, time out, pause. We don't become robots. All of us sitting here know that we don't become robots when we become, when we become followers of Christ. It is an innate desire that comes with the Holy Spirit that makes us want to follow Christ. So, there is a new creation, a new spirit that says, I want to walk in obedience with Christ. I want to do what he says. I want to pursue those things. Because what does Paul say later on in this? He says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things that I'm doing. So we know that it's, it, it doesn't just magically snap into perfection. It is a process of sanctification, of working it out day in, day out, of obedience, working towards Christ. So, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved to good works. So let me say that again so no one gets confused here. We are not saved by good works. We are saved to good works. Meaning that our salvation will be worked out. It means it'll be evident. People will see it. That you're not like a closet Christian. You're not a, like we used to say, like CIA or FBI Christian, where you're like, you're like, hey, look at my badge. I'm undercover. No undercover. So faith and obedience, these are a, a couple of things that I really wanted to hit on if we don't get uh, to the end here. 
Faith and obedience are two sides to the same coin of salvation. Faith and obedience. That's where we get this phrase in verse uh, 5 here. Obedience in faith. They're, they're married together. So they're two sides to the same coin. Because we need to understand that submission to Jesus as Lord is included in part of salvation. Where we're saying, I will be obedient in faith to know that you are going to work it out. That we are working in faith to be obedient to Christ. Because how many times does, does God prompt us to do something and we're like, I don't know where that's going. I don't see on the other side of that door, but I'm going to go do it and I'm going to walk in faith and obedience because you told me to. Obedience and faith. Uh, next phrase here is for his name's sake. For his name's sake. Salvation is a display of God's glory. And in that glory, we see his mercy, his love, his compassion, his kindness, his joy, all of these parts of God. Because when a sinner comes to Christ, it is only by God's power did he come. So guess what? He gets the glory. God alone gets the glory because God alone is salvation. And what do we read in Ephesians 8 and 9? We are saved by grace. That's given by God. Through faith. Given by God. Not of ourself. It's not of you. It is the gift of God. Not of works, because we could work, right? So he's saying, it's not of you. It's not of works. Everything else in that verse is saying everything is from God. Everything is from God. So when we, when you see someone come to salvation, when you see someone come to follow Christ, God gets all the glory. All of it. It's not... It's not of the person. It is not of the preacher. It is not of the, the moment. It is not of the atmosphere. It is of God and the prompting of the Holy Spirit to say, will you follow me? Will you repent of your sins and follow me? Will you come to know me? Will you follow me? And the only thing we can say is yes and amen. So I have it in here. It says, think of it this way. Because of God's character and in his character is grace. Our salvation is a byproduct of God's glory because that's who he is. That's, that is God's innate character. So when someone believes on Christ, they are when, and they're saved. But most importantly, it's that God is glorified because God is the giver of salvation through his sovereign power and will, where he is and always will be the contributing factor to salvation. And in that, we see, we see Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father working in tandem together to bring us to salvation. The Father's will the son's sacrifice, and the spirit's drawing. And then if you reverse it back, the spirit seals us. The son is our defense. And we are protected from, from the, the judgment that would come from the father. All three working together in tandem for salvation. And I'm going to go until I get yelled at. Uh, so you can answer this question on your own. 
but uh, how has this scripture deepened your understanding of salvation? But the last verse here, verse 7, the gift of the gospel. To all who are beloved in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father for the Lord Jesus Christ. The first phrase we're going to look at is all beloved of God. One of the greatest privileges of God, of God's saving grace is to be called beloved. You and I, brothers and sisters, get to be called beloved of God. Amen. He only calls his own <clears throat> beloved. In my life, I only call one person beloved. And she's back there holding a baby right now. I, I only have a very select, I have a select person that I call my beloved. And God calls each one of his children, followers of him, beloved. That's awesome. Amen. Not only are we called beloved, we're called saints. Those who have been drawn by the spirit of God to know him. Not a title of saint, but the group that has been called by God, we have become saints together. Grace and peace is the next phrase that we're going to look at in the last phrase. Grace and peace, those who can only receive the blessing of grace and peace are those who are his beloved. Grace and peace be to you, my beloved. Those who can receive grace and peace from a sovereign and mighty and powerful, and, and the Psalms and Proverbs call him uh, 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 the fearful and, and, and sometimes the terrible, because of his awesome, infinite power. But he calls us beloved saints, and we gain grace and peace offered by him. Those beloved are the only ones who can call God their father. There's a, there's a, um, there's a phrase that goes out a lot, and, and some people mean good by it, but it, it's, it's a heretical statement, is that uh, we're all children of God. We're not. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Let me just, we're not. Are we all made with intrinsic value and in the image of God? Yes. Are we all children of God? No, because the only ones who are his children are his beloved, those who follow him, those who love him, those who give themselves to him, his beloved church. So, we are his children, we are his beloved, we are his saints, and we are given grace and peace through Jesus Christ. So, the question is, how have you used the gift of the gospel? How have you used it? Have we used it to just pocket it? Or ha have we used the gospel to further his kingdom, to be his children, being his ambassadors, to be his hands and feet, to do his will, to listen to him in obedience, because we are to be obedient in faith, because those are two sides of the same coin to salvation of obedience and faith. So, in conclusion the God of part one, we got to verse seven, part one, the gospel transforms us from the core of our being and becomes our identity. Because at the center of the gospel is the person of Jesus Christ. We assume a new identity because the gospel of Jesus Christ makes us new. It takes a heart of stone and makes it a heart of flesh, as it says in Ezekiel. We partake in the gift of the gospel and salvation, grace, and peace, and we, and we too will impart that gift to the lost through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So everything that we partake in as followers of Christ, we are commanded to give to a lost and dying world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thus ends part one of <laughs> We have a long way to go and a short time to get there. <laughs> so, uh, any questions, comments?
I don't want to say concerns. <laughs> but any questions, comments? Good job, bro. Uh, if not, thank you. Uh, you want to? I'll say bye to these people. <laughs>